Okay, so those of you who are here from 9001, thank you. For those of you that are here from elsewhere, thank you as well. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Trusso. Sam is a uh, cross appointment, or a joint appointment rather, between the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Information Media Studies here. Uh, Sam is a, uh, formerly a lawyer in the state of California. He was also a law librarian at Bold Hall at the University of California, Berkeley, where he did his PhD in Information Studies. And he has been heavily involved in issues of academic and intellectual freedom and copyright here in Canada. Uh, he's got a, a serious background with this issue. He's already represented us before, or been involved rather, in the last round of filtering that came up at London Public Library. He is a former member of the uh, Intellectual Freedom Advisory Committee for the CLA, as well as the Copyright Committee, uh, up till September 30th of this year. Just last week? Just last week, they <laughs> said that he was done. Uh, anyhow, so uh, we're very lucky to have him, and uh, I'm looking forward to the talk. I hope you all too. And there'll be some little time for questions at the end. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, internet filtering is one of those issues that really cuts across um, legal issues and library issues and ethical issues and uh, library management issues very, very nicely. So uh, regardless of what your, what your plans are, I think uh, for, for a variety of different, uh, for a variety of different you know, futures that you may have in the library and information world, I think filtering is an excellent, um, it's a case study in, in the conflict between different rights, between different views, and how they come to head, to the head in a public library. And for those of us like Professor Irwin and myself, who are, who are students of uh, studying library boards, as a matter of fact, uh, Bill Irwin and myself gave a presentation at the last CLA um, conference on uh, the, the behavior and the way of operating of uh, public library uh, boards, uh, tr tr trustees. For those of us that are interested in this area, internet filtering is just, again, it's a great case study. Because what you end up with is a real clash between some of the most deeply held values of librarianship, some of the most deeply held values of intellectual freedom, freedom of speech, the Charter, the First Amendment, if you're in the United States, on the one hand, and the, um, the views of other members of the community who, who want to restrict, um, sometimes for very legitimate reasons, I should say, in the case of pornography, for exceptionally legitimate reasons who want to restrict what's available to um, patrons in, in the library. So I, I want to start out, and whenever I talk to the press about this, I always start out with the ground rule, and that is, don't ask me what I think. It's a good use of public funds for people to be able to go into the internet and download pornography, because that's not what the debate's about. And once you frame the debate in those terms, you've lost you've lost. And the, 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 the forces who are trying to, for a variety of different reasons, force public library boards into imposing filters, imposing filter, filter restrictions, or perhaps filter protections, depending on what your point of view is. Um, you, can't let, you can't let others define the debate. So for us, the debate has to always be the center point. What is the nature of the harm that's going on in the library? What is the evidence of what the harm is? And as, as my friend John Picasso always, always reminds me, evidence-based librarianship is very important. We make too many decisions in the field these days without it being based on evidence. So, so when somebody comes to your board, and many of you very shortly are going to be in positions where you're going to be staffing uh, public library um, board meetings, if not as the top person, maybe as the second secondary person or specialist who's brought in, you have to be looking at the evidence. You have to be aware of what's going on on the floor in your library. And is there anybody here from London Public um, today? Um, I spoke to uh, the director, and uh, she's very happy that we're here talking about this today, and she wishes she could be um, with us. And she also uh, has, has asked me to, on behalf of LPL, extend, uh, extend a reminder to all of you that at the next few London Public Library board meetings, there are going to be some discussions about this very, very topic. And it would be a very good opportunity. How many of you have uh, never been to a library board meeting of public trustees? Most of you. I can do it the other way, and I know Bill would raise his hand. Bill, Bill is the uh, past chair of the London Public Library um, board. Any other former or current trustees in the room? Is Ken, Ken here? Um, we have a few trustees on the floor. Um, 
it's very likely that you'll find yourself in a position as a staff member in a public library of uh, having to de deal with this. Because if it's going on in London, it's probably going on other places, too. Things tend to get a little extreme in London, and L London's a great place to do case studies because of all the, of all the characters and the way things really get um, sort of built up here in London. But if it's going on in London, it's probably going on perhaps a little more maybe under the surface in other, in other communities, um, too. How many of you plan on going into public libraries, by the way? Yeah, quite, quite, a, quite, a, quite, a, few, quite a few of you. That's, that's great. So, so basically, um, what I want to talk about today is um, I want to start with the idea that computer algorithms are very inherently untrustworthy. Because if you look at that picture with the context, you know what it is. How many of you have seen that picture up there? And this is, this is one of the most famous pieces of photojournalism from the 1960s. And it's one of those few moments in, in photography history where something was captured that, that just had so much, you don't need any text. You don't need any text here. Now, if you just, if you just sort of focused in on that a little bit and said, well, what, what's going on in this picture? There's a naked girl and she's running. And she looks like she's got a very uncomfortable look on her, on her face. If you took that out of context, you might reach a very different conclusion about what that is. Now, of course, once you bring out the rest of the, once you bring out the rest of the, um, the shot, you can see, you can see what's um, going on. Similarly, here, you're all familiar. This is a lot more recent. This is another piece of um, very powerful photo journalism, which, while um, it's, uh, you, you have naked human bodies involved in the picture, um, this this could not, under any circumstances, be considered pornographic. This is about, um, well, it's about a lot of different issues that I'm not here today to talk about the conduct of, uh, of, of, of the war in Iraq or other places. But this is about a lot of things, and pornography is, uh, is not one of them. So back in 2007, and uh, I want to try to bring this story up to date. Um, what's happening right now, by the way, is every year the London Public Library does an annual review of its internet policy. And that's going to be taking place at the October and at the November uh, LPL board meetings. And I'll talk more about that at the, at the end. Um, they don't have filters in the, adult, in the adult terminals in the LPL now. The filters were removed in November of 2007. But if we go back to May of 2007, at the May board meeting, um, the London Public Library Board voted to adopt the Internet Policy Review Project, a staff report which was not part of the agenda posted in advance, because um, if it was, I think a lot of us from the community probably would have been there to voice our objections, but it was, it was placed down at the trustees' table right before the meeting. And they discussed the purpose of the project. And basically, the, 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 the director at the time, who is no longer the uh, director at LPL, there's since been a change in the, in the director, but the purpose of the project was to review the balance of filtered and unfiltered um, uh, machines in, in the library. Um, they, they're concerned about an individual's experience in the library in terms of unintentional exposure to visual images. Now, there is a problem that needs to be dealt with unintentional exposure to unwanted images. And from what we can tell, the, the justification for the, for the filtering project in London was some complaints about unintentional exposure to um, you know, un, unwanted, unwanted images. So the, you know, the, the idea of the library undertaking steps to study this, to gather evidence, to get a sense of how widespread the problem is, to come up with a list of potentially ameliorating measures that could deal with this problem of unintentional exposure to unwanted images would have been a good study. But basically, what they ended up doing was, right at the start, putting filters on most of the machines in the library, save a few. It's like 80% of the adult machines. So basically, here's the evidence. This goes back to the 2007 staff report, 
we have received negative comments on an infrequent but regular basis. And you just stop and unpack that for a moment. Infrequent but regular. And I, and I wanted to do a, sh I just wanted to do sort of a snapshot of the report so there couldn't be any question of whether I maybe, when I was copying and pasting the text, whether I got it wrong. That's a photographic image of the report. Um, negative comments on an infrequent but regular basis from customers. From customers at central and branch locations, um, we will provide a welcoming environment for all people, um, which, is, which is absolutely, which is absolutely about, uh, proper. Our mission statement and value promises, promise assures customers. So again, right from the start, the library patron is being characterized here as, as a customer. Um, in my view, that is one of the fundamental flaws of the, uh, of the entire operation. Because once you cross that line and characterize your patrons as customers, this is the sort of thing that is likely to happen. Because if you have customers, you are going to have valued customers. And if you have valued customers, you probably have other customers who aren't so valued. And if you have valued customers and somewhat valued customers, you probably have people who you don't even consider the types of people who you want there as, as customers. So in my view, and those of you who have heard me talk before, know that I make a big deal about this. Um, customers, is, it's not just a word that annoys some. It's a word that has very, very serious connotations and overtones to it. Um, so from the period, the study period was supposed to be June through October 2007. Mm -hmm. Public computers were going to be filtered. Well, the word got out about what happened at the May meeting. And uh, members of the community, including a number of faculty members here at FIMS, uh, members of the um, uh, then active CLA Intellectual Freedom uh, Advisory, uh, uh, Advisory Committee, including uh, Tony Samick, who was the chair at the time, started writing in to the board. I sent in a letter, Roma Harris sent in a letter, Tony Samick sent in a letter. A number of people from the community started sending in letters. And at the June meeting, uh, there were two members of the board in particular. Um, interestingly, and this is typically not the situation in, in sort of uh, filtering issues with public library boards, but interestingly, it was the two members of city council, it was two elected members of city council, who uh, Nancy Bransko and uh, Gina Barber, who were the most critical of the decision that they had made in May. And they, they, they're saying that they, they really hadn't realized the implications of what they had done in, in the May meeting. And they voted to rescind. They wanted to rescind and send it back for the type of uh, evidence-based information collection and gathering that one would think would normally go into um, policy, policy making. Um, they were ruled out of order by the chair because they didn't give proper notice for the motion to rescind. And uh, it was put over to the next board meeting. They don't meet in the summer, so it was put over to the September meeting. So what we had in the fall um, was a series of very, very contentious and well-attended um, meetings at the London Public Library Board, where on several occasions, members of the community on both sides of the issue um, came out. At one point, uh, members of the public were invited to, um, to speak, which was good. Probably something that they could have done before they made the policy change, but um, one of the um, one of the speakers who really caught my attention was a representative from the police department who said, once you've got the filters installed, we're going to want to talk to you about expanding the categories. Because back in the uh, ancient days of 2007, probably before many of you were born, right? <laughs> really, really long time ago in the history of, uh, of technology, um, the idea of social networking and using the internet for things like uh, chat groups and these new sort of Facebook groups and things like that. It was just viewed as fundamentally dangerous to our children and evil, something the police department was very concerned about. I'm not sure how much things have changed 
in four years in terms of the attitude of some people towards uh, social networking sites. But cer certainly, certainly um, in terms of the number of people in society, including most people running for political office, um, these have become very, very popular types of sites. So I, I don't think that we would run the risk of going that far down the slope again. But just to give you an idea of the type of discussion that was up before the board, there was serious discussion about getting the filters going and then looking at some of the other, uh, looking at some of the other um, sites. So one of the interesting undertones of the debate that was going on at the time was that um, those of us who were trying to raise intellectual freedom concerns, largely from the library community, largely from the organized library community, were, we felt that we were being somewhat marginalized by the library management. Who, who, would, who would start out by saying, um, the project is not about restricting intellectual freedom. It's about reducing the risk of unintentional exposure of customers to images, their, their words. Trying to shift the discussion out of the intellectual freedom context and into, well, you don't really think it's appropriate for people to have to look at this stuff in the library, do you? And again, by asking the question differently, um, you get very different. Uh, you can get very different answers. And I remember going on the radio on several occasions. We have some. We have some. Uh, I guess I'll just call them Rush Limbaugh wannabes, who are on uh, talk radio here in London. And uh, I, I'm, I'm such a sucker for going on the radio. They call me up and they say, "Hey, you want to go on the Andy Newton So I'm sort of like, "Yeah, sure." And it's like you, you end up getting scalped every time. It's just, it's just terrible what they do to you when you're on one of those. Um, Shows and they say, oh, well, here's a university professor who thinks that intellectual freedom includes letting wackos come down to the library and a taxpayer's money look at child pornography. <laughs> I didn't realize I was, I was, that, I was that bad. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the question could have been framed, uh, should, we be using, uh, should we be using taxpayers' money to purchase proprietary software that no one knows how it's going to work? To, um, to filter out constitutionally protected materials to users of uh, library services. So it really, again, it depends how you frame, uh, how you frame the uh, question. We've come a long way in London, because when that gentleman was gone, he had a more rational uh, sort of a substitute host who had Bill Irwin uh, on a few, a, few, a few weeks ago. And the, um, the intellectual content of the discussion was, um, was very different. I don't know how many of you had a chance to hear Professor Irwin when he was on the radio, but it was, it was uh, the, the question. Like, they just like me better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question was just framed uh, very, very, uh, very, very different. But it's sort of like, well, you come off of a radio interview and you're like, I am never going back on, I'm never going back on the radio. That was just a very unpleasant uh, uh, ex experience. Anyway. Initially, London Public Library, um, they're using this uh, software program called NetSweeper. Now, the advantage of NetSweeper is, number one, it's a Canadian company. It's based, it's based here in Ontario, in the Northern Kitchener uh, region. And number two, it's relatively new. So there, there has been, throughout the late 90s, since the internet started being installed in libraries in the United States, there was a lot of um, controversy in the United States about internet filtering. And a lot of research had been done, particularly in the United States, on different internet filtering products. And what, what came to light uh, was largely the conclusion that many of these um, internet filtering products were highly flawed, both from a technological point of view, but also from an ideological point of view, and that they were, um, they were very biased against not just the kind of pornography that they were being uh, geared to uh, combat, but also um, anything that had to do with gay, alternative lifestyles, uh, certain strands of um, feminism, certain strands of um, activism were, uh, were not doing well under some of these uh, filters. And many of these products had been exposed. So one of the advantages of NetSweeper was that they didn't have this association. <clears throat> now, it's since been understood that NetSweeper is very involved in the international market in terms of selling systems to Middle Eastern countries, for example. Mm -hmm and et cetera, um, who were involved in um, um, trying to filter a lot more than just pornography. And keep in mind that this is not a pornography filter. This is a filter that can set it to 41 alternative lifestyles. 
um, uh, set it to uh, 152, no email. You would get on a machine and you want to check your email, and you just don't want to check email. That, that's very important. Um, streaming media, anything to do with alcohol. Um, let's see. Investing. <laughs> With when people going on to investment uh, investment sites, and so in any event, the user has a certain the user being the library, not the end user, <coughs> but the library has a certain amount of um, the, the the customer, the customer, the institutional customer of the software vendor here, has a bit of um, has a bit of uh, latitude in terms of uh, what to um, what what to um, what, what what to filter out. Cult criminal skills. We're not talking about criminal trial advocacy or evidence, of course, in the law school. We're talking about criminal skills, how you go about being a, uh, a, better, uh, a better criminal. Yes, there are websites that, that, apparently, um, that apparently do that. Games. There's a big category. You don't want people playing games. Say you're an employer. You don't want people um, playing games, unless, of course, you're a game company. But uh, generally, you don't want people doing that at work. And um, this product is, is largely sold to private industry. It's largely sold to church groups. It's largely sold to foreign governments. It's largely sold to um, primary schools, where the question of filtering is a very, very different question than the question in public libraries, because of the fact that the, uh, the, school, the school district, the school board, um, is, in, is in the role of local parentis with the children that are, that are in school, which is not the situation in the public library, even in the children's room. You don't have that loco parentis um, legal, legal relationship. So uh, the blocking of nine, they, they started by blocking nine, extreme, and 23 pornography. And they decided to um, take off the filtering against nine, because after the first month or two, they, they came to the conclusion that there just wasn't sufficient traffic going, going to nine. So nine would be things like, Rape my poo, um, and the like. That that's that sort of um, thing. Um, ex ex extreme, sick, gory pictures, um, and then there's pornography, 23, which I think it's important to point out. And I'm going to make this distinction very precisely in some of my later slides that talk about the provisions in the criminal code dealing with obscenity, which is a very different legal category than pornography. Um, it includes soft and hardcore porn, uh, adult magazines, toys, or any any sexual related um, purchase, which includes a lot of materials that are not prescribed by um, duly enacted um, uh, provisions in, in the law. I'm going to use the term butler materials and non-butler materials. Not uh, butler materials are. There's this famous case that I'll talk about, Butler that went up to the Supreme Court of Canada, Butler materials would be considered um, obscenity, which has a very specific legal <coughs> definition, child pornography, things that are illegal. Um, but it, it, categories 9 and 23 contain a lot of what we will call, for our purposes, non-Butler um, materials. And remember, non-Butler materials are constitutionally protected, as much as you might not like some. So, the question of whether or not to filter uh, internet terminals in public libraries has, has um, it's not new. It seems new because it hasn't been a big issue in Canada the way it was in the United States. But by the mid-90s, when we started to see um, internet terminals becoming uh, very commonplace in public libraries, uh, we saw a growing controversy um, across, across, across the country in many, in many different states. Um, many legislatures in the United States, state legislatures, Congress, um, local boards, tried mandating filtering. And time and again, they were frustrated by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And um, the history of the litigation in the United States would take a long time to talk about. There were many, many different cases. Uh, the, the American Library Association was always in the Freedom to Read Foundation, were always in the middle of those cases. And over the years, the American Library Association has probably spend millions, if not tens of millions, of uh, dollars um, 
sort of fighting, fighting internet um, filtering um, provisions in court. It's, it's something they take um, very, very seriously. Canada is a much less litigious country. It's less extreme. At least, at least I used to think. At least I used to think so. Certainly, when I came here to Canada in the uh, in 2000, in 2001, um, there just wasn't the same type of intensity on this and other issues as there had been in um, in the United States. Um, to date, there is no published legal decision in Canada that applies some of the uh, constitutional principles that I'm going to be talking about to uh, internet filtering. And there, there are, there's a whole lot of case law in the United States. Um, internet filtering has generally been um, very disfavored by library associations um, on the grounds of intellectual freedom and access to information. There are a whole series of court cases. There are a whole series of ALA um, resolutions. Um, uh, uh, we could do a whole course just going through all of the background materials that the ALA and Office of Intellectual Freedom have published um, over the years. We can only scratch the surface um, here. Uh, then finally, there was a Children's Internet Protection Act that was enacted in 2000 that wasn't based on filtering. It didn't say you had to filter. That type of approach had already been ruled unconstitutional. In a very split decision, only four of the nine justices voted in favor of it. But there was no majority decision. And you get those splits in the United States Supreme Court. Um, SIPA was upheld as within Congress's spending authority. Because what SIPA did was it said, if you want your federal money, you can't filter. And the government said, oh, well, we can't do this directly, so we'll try using, we'll try using the spending power. And while many people think that that was just as unconstitutional, um, four of the nine judges, Rehnquist, O'Connor, Scalia, and uh, Thomas, um, up upheld it. So the state of the law, it's not as clear as it had been before the SIPA decision, but there's still a lot of good case law on the books that says if a, if a, if a, if a board imposes filtering across the board, that would, be, that would be unconstitutional. And I think that that's largely good law still in light of um, the very, very confusing and conflicting um, decision in, um, in SIPA, especially when you consider that there's been some uh, turnover in, in the court. Many libraries in the United States have just said, just take your funding, we'll, we'll get it someplace else. Of course, this has a disparate effect on the, uh, on the, poorer, on the poorer districts. So um, the, the research question here, which I'll I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to spend a few minutes looking at the um, Canadian Charter and some of the uh, case law in, in Canada is how would a Canadian court respond to um, just the simple case of a uh, mandated filtering? So there's, uh, there's currently a bill in the, um, well there was a bill in the provincial parliament that would have mandated public libraries and school boards to impose filtering. We have uh, at least a couple of instances where the London, Public, the London Public Library actually imposed filtering. If this were challenged, if this were challenged, how would, um, how would a Canadian court uh, deal with this under, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? So basically, there, there are two provisions from the Charter that we need to, that we need to look at. Uh, the first one, well, the second one is the right, the fundamental right that you have under the Charter. Everyone has the following fundamental freedoms including freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression, including freedom of the press and other media of communication. And I don't have time here today to spend a lot of time comparing that language to what's in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. But it is a bit broader. It doesn't just talk about um, speech. It, it just doesn't talk about expression. It talks about sort of like the entire information gathering life, life cycle here a bit, because we're talking about thought, belief, opinion not just the expression. So it seems, it seems as if, well, it's clear that the right to receive information, while those words are not clearly used as such, as they no doubt should have been, it's clear that um, the, 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 right, the right to receive information is, um, has to necessarily be included with, within this. And that, that, I think, is a very, very sustainable um, view. Now, just because something violates Section 2B 
doesn't mean that's the end of the case. And this is where it gets very complicated, and this is where library board policy has to be looking for evidence. Section 1 says, it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of, it, it, it limits Section 2. Section 2 is not absolute. Subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law. So it has to be a reasonable limit. It has to be prescribed by law. And it has to be demonstrably justifiable. Justified in a free and democratic society. Not perhaps justified, or maybe justified, but demonstrably um, justified. So every one of these words is important. The word demonstrably is important. And the other, word, the other words that are here are reasonable limits. And the other, the other thing that's important here is prescribed by law. Because I would make the argument that if you delegate the decision about whether to deselect something from your collection as a matter of law, which is basically what a filtering program does, then that decision is not prescribed by law. It's being done by a computer algorithm. And if it's being done by a computer algorithm, it's not being done with the type of human judgment that you would generally um, associate with something being prescribed by law. Something can be prescribed by law and still delegated to other people. And I'm not sure about a computer. I'm not sure about a computer program. So there have been numerous cases finding infringements of Section 2B, yet the measure was saved under the Section 1 analysis. Um, the Supreme Court basically, to simplify this, they first determine whether or not the activity falls within the freedom of expression. And assuming it does, <coughs> then they then they look at they, then they go through the section one through the section one analysis. Um, courts would likely find, and I don't think this is subject to any dispute, courts would likely find that internet filtering by a public agency, because the charter only applies to public to public action. It doesn't apply to private employers. It doesn't apply to um, private schools. It applies to public public agencies. Clearly, a library board is a creature of the municipality. Clearly, the public library board is a creature of the province. Actually, so that would be that would be public. Um, it would it would be it would be a violation of Section 2B. The Supreme Court in Butler said restricting obscenity is a violation of Section 2B, but it's justified under Section 1. So the question isn't whether or not it would be considered a violation of Section 2B. It most certainly would. The question would be whether or not it would be saved under a uh, you know, generous reading under um, section, section 1. So we really have to get into a little bit more detail in order to understand what public library boards need to do when they're faced with these filtering issues. We need to spend a little bit more time uh, looking, at, um, looking at Section 1. And I need to. I need to go a little faster if I'm going to finish this um, in an hour. Uh, so, uh, so this Oaks, Oaks test, the Oaks case, is a very famous early charter case that laid out the general roadmap for how courts should, should, should go about doing section one analysis. And you don't get to an application of the Oaks test until you've triggered a violation of not just Section 2B, which is the one that we're concerned with here, but any constitutional, any constitutional um, violation. So basically, the first thing you do is you look at the importance of the objective of the limiting measure. Now, how do you determine that? <clears throat> totally relevant here. What is the objective? What's the underlying objective that motivated the limiting measure? Uh, this is why it's so important for library boards to really think about what they're doing before they, before they do it. Because infrequent yet regular complaints from customers, <coughs> there's this other rule, and I, I don't have the time to talk about the detail, but there's other rule that says no shifting, no shifting purposes. You state your purpose and you're stuck with that, you're stuck with that purpose. So I think that if this went to court, the purpose in the first prime to the oak test would be would be evidenced by what's in that 
May 2007 staff report that talked about the infrequent yet regular complaints from customers. Um, is that a legitimate enough interest? Um, it, it could be. It could be. Um, we, we, would, we, would, we would normally give the, um, the impugned measure, the government that enacted the impugned measure, quite a bit of latitude with that first prompt of the Oaks test. Uh, taking measures to uh, you know, protect people from uh, 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 exposure to, to unwanted um, images, yeah, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's a legitimate um, measure. Uh, there are a couple of other prongs of the test that are still to come, so we're not, we're not conceding the case here. We're just saying, yeah, that, that's, that's, a legitimate, that's a legitimate measure. The other reason why you're probably going to pass the first prong of the Oaks test here is the, the London Public Library Board report, well, it was the staff report, framed the objective in such general terms that it's almost hard to argue with. It was so general. So if you frame, if you frame your objective in very, very general terms, it may help you get over the first prong of the Oaks test. But the problem is, that's going to be your baseline from which to test the other prongs of the Oak test. And if it's too general, you're likely to get into some trouble with the second, third, and fourth, and fourth uh, prongs. The other thing is, the onus is on the government to establish. Once you've made out a prima facie violation of Section 2B, the onus then shifts to the government to establish all of the elements of a Section 1 um, justification. So the, the, the means chosen to reach this objective must be proportionate. It must be proportionate. What is the reasonableness of the means adopted to achieve the objective? And there are actually three subcomponents to that. So even if we give the uh, government agency a lot of latitude with respect to that first, first prompt, there's still, there's still quite a bit of analysis in, in the second one. So courts have been deferential to legislative judgments with respect to the first prong. Um, I don't really want to talk a lot about the particular facts of the Oaks case because we're just sort of we're pulling out of that case general principles. It was not a Section 2B case. It was a, it was a criminal law. <coughs> it was a criminal law case. Okay, so there has to be a rational connection between the stated objectives and the limitation. It cannot be arbitrary or capricious. Next, we have what's called the minimal impairment test. And this is where your knowledge of what goes on on the floor of a public library comes in very handy. This is why librarians need to be driving this policy. Would there be other reasonable ways to satisfy the, the objective that, 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 that legitimate government objective that we just defined in, in, in the first prong of the Oaks test, which in this case is very generally stated, but it would probably pass muster. Are there, um, are there other reasonable ways to satisfy that objective that would have less impact on the underlying constitutional right being, uh, being impaired? Um, the Oaks itself spoke of least restrictive, least restrictive means. Later cases loosened that up a little bit. It doesn't have to be absolutely the least restrictive, but you still have to show that there are not other reasonable alternatives. And then finally, you do this overall balance in terms of the proportionality of, um, of, of the limitation on the right as compared with the means that are being used, as compared with the underlying interest. Certainly, the more precise you are in terms of articulating that underlying interest, the easier it's going to be for you to meet the fourth prong of the, uh, of the Oaks test. Compelling the observance of a Christian Sabbath was not considered a compelling objective. Requiring the recital of the Lord's Prayer is not, was not considered a, permiss a permissible um, objective. Um, curbing cigarette ads for health reasons was considered to be um, a rational objective. Limiting obscenity, not pornography, but limiting obscenity, not based on a moral argument, which is not recognized, <coughs> but based on harm-based evidence, is a legitimate, um, is a legitimate um, way to meet the first prong of the um, uh, Oaks test. Limiting harm caused by hate speech, a legitimate um, interest. 
denying protection of the human rights laws to gays and lesbians, not a proper, not a proper objective. Um, so you, you have all these cases that dealt with the first, with the first prong. Um, pornography, um, under Butler, child pornography, under Sharp, hate speech, under Keekstra. All of these Supreme Court decisions, which ended up upholding, in large part, the impugned measures, all, all qualify the underlying <coughs> speech, hate speech, obscenity, child pornography, all, all said that this, is, this was a violation of 2B, a facial violation of 2B. So to make the statement that this is protected by 2B, from a legalistic point of view, is not much of a stretch. I can imagine what that sounds like to the, to the morning radio audience when the professor gets on and says, well, you know, even, even child pornography is protected by, uh, by, by Section uh, 2B, which is not the same thing to say that it's constitutionally protected because you still have to go through the Section 1 analysis, but try explaining it. <laughs> try, 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 um, try explaining it. So the action is in the Section 1 analysis. If you take nothing else away from this discussion of 2B and Section 1, just, just remember that the real action is going to be in the Section 1 uh, analysis, which you can parse down to a couple of levels. Um, so here's Section 163 of the uh, Criminal Code. Now, <coughs> if a criminal code provision, criminal code is enacted by Parliament, if a criminal code provision violates the Charter, it's going to be tossed out. So we have, um, um, there, there's a prohibition here on uh, certain, cert doing certain things with obscene material. Um, I'm not seeing any case law on publicly exhibiting a disgusting object. I'm not sure what a disgusting object is, but this is the type of language that uh, parliamentarians uh, like to use. We're going to focus in on the very, very precise definition of obscenity, which um, in 163.8 is, um, is defined. This is a precise definition. This definition is so precise that the court in Butler said, this is OK. It's specific. It's specific enough. So any publication, a dominant characteristic of which is not just, not just the exploitation of sex. <coughs> it's a very, very specific, very specific subset of that. It's got to be undue. And then you have these ways of sort of meeting the requirement of, 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 of something being deemed <clears throat> undue. Not all pornography is obscene. Not all, even hardcore pornography, is obscene. Certainly soft pornography is not obscene. And certainly there is this whole borderline area where people aren't really sure whether something is just art or whether it crosses the line into pornography. Clearly, that's not um, obscene. So this definition of obscenity was upheld in the 1992, in the 1992 um, Butler decision. Now, Butler was a sex shop operator. Um, the court agreed that the prohibition was a 2B violation. So they, they got into the Section 1 analysis. Um, and they, 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 looked at, they looked at what was going on very carefully. And they said the harm is not based on an offense to morals. It's, it's based on what was shown from evidence to be harm to a particular class of people. The prohibition was narrowly drafted, and it was upheld. So the legitimate objective requirement was met. But all those proportionality rules were met, too, in this, in this, particular, in this particular case. Um, so R versus Butler upholds um, the prohibition on obscenity. Um, same thing done in Keekstra. Same thing done in, uh, in Sharp. Um, we use the term generically now, um, Butler materials and non-Butler materials. There was also um, the Little Sisters bookstore and an art emporium um, case, which is like this, on, it went up to the Supreme Court, but it's this like, ongoing saga of continuing disputes between that Vancouver-based um, bookstore and, and, and merchandise uh, cataloger and uh, the federal government with respect to their uh, conduct at the um, border. And then the more recent 
R versus uh, Glad Day Bookshops, which was in a, this was not a Supreme Court decision. This was this was I don't want to say merely because it was a court, um, but it was an Ontario Superior Court decision. Uh, and this is a this is a shop that was in in Toronto on uh, on Young Street. And I think I'm just going to skip ahead. I'll make these slides um, available um, as part of the um, presentation. Um, the more information about the ongoing Little Sisters controversy can be found <coughs> at their website. The reason why I'm so interested in the Little Sisters case, other than the fact that it was a very famous case, is at the time we were going through this in 2007, if you went to the Little Sisters bookstore website, NetSweeper had it characterized as pornography. Now, you could argue that if you, if you go into, a, if, you, if you click on 18 and go into their catalog, there were, there were, there were products there that were, that, were, that were associated with sexual activity. Um, yet the entire website was characterized by um, NetSweeper as pornographic. Even the pages, even the pages that were only text. Because they, the, they had this whole section on legal document archives from their fight with the federal government. And if you went into one of those archive text-only pages and ran that URL with that specific page through NetSweeper, you still got 23 pornography, which suggests that it's not a very, very good product. Because once a website is tainted, apparently everything on that website is tainted um, along, along with it. Now, this website has since been reclassified as a result of some of the activities that were going on in the London Public Library Board, uh, NetSweeper had been contacted. And I, I think that NetSweeper was contacted by a few people about this, and they finally made the decision to uh, reclassify it. But somebody had to go in. Somebody had to go in and do that. Somebody had to go in and, uh, and actually um, fix, fix that. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Glad Day bookstore. There used to be this rule that um, films had to be um, screened in advance before they could be shown. And this operator was, uh, was, was, violating, was violating that, um, was violating that law. This was a prior restraint. What's important about this case, though, is even at just a 3% censorship rate, which is what the history of the film board um, was with respect to the movies, that, the films that had been submitted to it, <clears throat> it still exercised us a censorship, which was deemed infrequent. And that's 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 at um, that's at three that's at three percent. Now the board was also using confidential internal guidelines, which I think is somewhat analogous to a proprietary algorithm, where you're you're not sort of like publishing ahead of time what the criteria. What are the classification criteria? How how did how did Little Sisters Bookstore get into pornography twenty three? Mm -hmm. What was the what was the what was the general rule of classification that um, that, that, that got it there. So, while the Glad Day case is a, um, you know, it's a provincial trial court decision, I think that there are a lot of analogies between that system of prior restraint that existed under the Ontario Theatre Act and internet filtering that would, that would similarly um, trouble, trouble a court. <coughs> court would find a violation of Section 2B, and they would, they would probably find a legitimate uh, government objective, and then then the real serious contentious um, analysis would, would begin. Um, I should say something else about the prescribed by law requirement. When you, when, you, when, you delegate, when you delegate a collection development decision, or in this case, uh, a collection undevelopment decision, um, you should delegate it to humans. And there should be an appeals process leading up to the board. So if you want to do a book challenge, the London Public Library has a very, very specific and, uh, and, and enumerated set of steps that you can see on their website for doing book challenges. And ultimately, it goes to the board. Um, and and, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's a human, it's a human um, decision. The thing that you have to remember about NetSweeper is it's a private company, so it's a proprietary algorithm. Um, I attempted to dislodge more information about the class classification system through a, a access to information request at the time, and then that was uh, hugely unsuccessful on, on the grounds that the, 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 the library was able to um, assert and the information commissioner agreed with them, 
but they didn't really have custody or control over the algorithm because they, they, they just didn't they just didn't have it because it was it was proprietary to um, to NetSweeper. I think I was trying to make the point that well, if the, if the public library is saying is arguing that they don't have access to how the classification system works, how can they use it? And I think the point was the point that point was probably well taken, but I, I still don't have. Um, detailed information about how um, that this classification system works. And frankly, I know so little about computer programming that even if they said, OK, Sam, here's the code, I'm not sure what I would do. Probably bring it to you, John. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I think the big question here is, what are some of the less restrictive alternatives that can exist on the library floor in terms of privacy screens, furniture arrangements, the placement of um, plants, the placement of other types of screens, um, a general atmosphere. Um, you, you just, there, there are a lot of things that could be done. If the problem is real, if the problem here is inadvertent exposure to unwanted images, there are some technological and physical spatial ways of, of dealing with that that I think would preclude a library from being able to successfully meet their onus under, um, under section, uh, under Article 1, the proportionality um, strands. So my, my conclusions here are that treating the issue of internet filtering in the London Public Library as a customer service issue under the customer service paradigm. Um, my mother. Mr. Irwin, please turn off your. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, anyway. Um, Treating this under the customer service paradigm is, is, is not a good way to go for libraries due, due to the fact that you've got these other requirements that are based not just on the ethical obligations of the profession, but also, um, also in the charter. And that you have to be very careful about saying, uh, well, our customers would like us um, to do this. Or we're getting some political pressure to, we're getting some political pressure to, um, to, to do this. Now, in June of 2008, CIPIC, the Public Interest Internet uh, Clinic at the University of Ottawa, sent the London Public Library Board, um, yes, it was a 10-page single-spaced letter outlining in detail how the Oaks test would play out. But it was, not, it was not a demand letter. It was not a get rid of the filters or we're going to sue you on behalf of this client. It was just a, you know, we thought you'd like to know about this. And, here we are, uh, a public interest law clinic, and we're sending you this um, this letter. And I've, I've linked to the I've linked to the letter in my um, in my article. But the London Public Library Board really took that letter seriously. It 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 it, it, it um, they heard that. It resonated. It resonated with them. I think something something that came from outside of the library community, something that came from outside of London, just resonated them with them a little bit more. And they didn't take the filters off as a result of the letter, but they hired their own independent counsel. They hired learners, a local a law firm. And we don't really know what the learner's letter said, because the library board refuses to release it. And again, I filed a FIPA and went to the, privacy, the Information and Privacy Commissioner. And uh, uh, of course, um, them not withholding that was upheld under solicitor, um, under solicitor um, client, so there wasn't a whole lot I could do um, about, about that. But I am under the opinion, given the current political reality of the situation, that the London uh, Public Library Board would be very well served by releasing that letter. They, they, they can do it. It's up to them. There's no law that says they can't release it because it came from the letter. They have the right not to release it. But it's their, it's their choice. Um, so basically, the, um, the learner's letter they summarized the gist of the learner's letter. And it was very clear that the learner's letter was pretty much telling them the same thing as the CIPIC letter. We just don't know, we just don't know all, of the, um, all of the details. So in November of 2008, oh, by the way, the CEO had left. And there was a new CEO who, um, without getting into a long discussion about the old CEO and the new CEO, I think it's fair to say that the current CEO is a little more library-oriented than the old um, CEO. 
I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here, but I think the current CEO uh, is, is, is a librarian, is a Western grad, um, has a very, very good understanding about the relationship between collections and intellectual freedom, whereas the former um, CEO had no um, library background prior to um, becoming the CEO. And I, and I think that's important. I think it's important that we, we sort of recruit our leadership uh, in the profession from the ranks of librarians. Um, and we see this question coming up again and again. We see libraries, uh, we see library directors saying, we're not going to be hiring librarians anymore. We're going to be hiring other, other people, not librarians. It's very important for the profession of librarianship to sort of fight to maintain its, uh, its well-deserved um, jurisdiction. And I, and I think uh, maybe having a requirement in the Ontario Public Libraries Act that said at least, at least the municipalities that are over a certain threshold of population, the CEO shall be the librarian. I think Saskatchewan does. Yeah. I believe Saskatchewan. Yeah. And uh, maybe, it's time, maybe it's time to do that. There's been a hesitancy in the Ontario public library community to open up the Public Library Act. Because back in the 90s, there were some really, really bad um, proposed revisions to it coming from the Harris government, which um, mercifully were rejected. Which is not something that happens with a majority government like that. Um, a whole lot, but there was such an outcry. Bill 109, what was that, 1997? Something, something like that, it was 1997. There was such an outcry against some of the provisions in Bill 109 that the majority government um, retracted it. And I've, I've been told over the years by, by some library directors that while they sympathize with the idea, they're hesitant to go to um, uh, provincial parliament to ask for a um, change in the Public Library Act because they still have that, um, they still have that experience fresh um, in their minds. But, so, so we have a new library director. There was some turnover on the board. One of the more conservative board members um, resigned after the CEO left and was replaced by Gloria Lecky, um, which was a very, very fortunate turn um, of events for the public library board to have someone um, of such knowledge and quality um, on the public library board. So things were starting to turn around. They got the learner's letter and they reversed the policy. <clears throat> but they didn't say that's the end of it, we're never going to filter again. What they said in 2008, and this is what's relevant in terms of what's coming up next month and the month after, is they said that um, we're going to um, we're going to do an annual review. So every year the London Public Library goes through all of their complaints and they, they, they look at all the statistics they, they log, they're able to, through, through computer analysis, log the types of websites that people <coughs> are looking at. And they've done very, very, they've, they've done a lot more evidence-based research over the last few years than they did in the period leading up to 2007. You can look at the 2010 annual report here. The 2011 annual report is in preparation right now. It probably will not be in the October packet it probably will be in the November packet, but that's something that we'll be, um, that we'll be, that we'll be looking for. There will be delegations and discussion at the October meeting, which is um, the 27th. And uh, this is something that you might want to consider sending uh, in written submissions <coughs> or making requests for individual delegation status. And it will also, it will also come to a decision at the November um, at the November board meeting. Finally, I wanted to get back in closing. It's always good to say in closing because that way sort of like your time is running down. Uh, in closing, this is from the website rotten.com. And rotten.com, it, it, it's got a lot of really rotten stuff um, on it. And rotten.com is uh, one of the websites that would be um, rated <coughs> extreme. But there is there are portals to pornography sites elsewhere on the Rotten.com website. However, here we have Rotten.com slash library slash crime slash prison. And this, 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 uh, they do a feature on different prisons. And here's, um, here's the Ivan Marie. And they've got these pictures. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, We've got these pictures, and if you do the test, and I did it this morning, 
I did it this morning. Um, it's still occult pornography portals. It's not even extreme. So that 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 picture is uh, as of this morning rated uh, pornography on on that sweeper. So uh, one of the first claims that I always make is that the technology just doesn't work. And that's a pretty. I mean, it works to some degree. I mean, it does filter out. I mean, tuna nets catch a lot of tuna. <laughs> tuna nets catch a lot of tuna, but they also catch a lot of dolphins and the really the really wary. Tunis, the charming tunas of the world, know how to get around um, um, the, uh, the tuna, the, the tuna net. So uh, I don't know if the tuna uh, net analogy is, is 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 good here, but here's here's an example of um, I don't know about Rotten.com as an overall website in terms of its authority, or if you were going to sort of feature different sites on on your library um, on your library top ten website list. I'm not sure you'd be featuring Rotten.com, but um, this particular page, at least, does seem to be, it's very critical of the Bush administration. And it does have, it does have some of the, um, it does have some of the pictures. So, um, go to this tester on NetSweeper and um, enter, enter the URLs for your favorite sites. And uh, you'll see, see what you can, see what you, see what you can find. So, um, there's going to be a lot of activity coming up, the London Public Library. Um, leading up to their October meeting, leading up to the November meeting. I hope a lot of you are going to be able to be there at these meetings. Go to the London Public Library website, go to Accessing the Board, and all the information will be there. They need, they want to be hearing from people from FEMS, they need to be hearing from people from FEMS, and those of you who are in library school right now are in a particularly good situation to be, um, to be watching this issue. So thank you all for um, coming and uh